All right, so welcome. This is The Big Picture with Ian Nash. I'm your host, Ian Nash. Uh, This is kind of like a new thing that I'm trying, kind of a new podcast idea. My uh, guest today is Grant Schnarr. Um, He is an associate professor of religion at Bernathan College in Bernathan, Pennsylvania, and I have a little bit of an intro to read for him. Grant Schnarr has had a career in pastoral work in Glenview in Chicago, Illinois, Bernathan, Pennsylvania, and was the director of evangelism for the International New Church for 13 years. He is the author of the novel, The Guardian Angel Diary, and also several books about growth and spirituality, including The Art of Spiritual Warfare, A Guiding, a Guide to Lasting Inner Peace, which has been published in a variety of languages by independent publishers on four continents. His book, You Can Believe, is a best-selling introduction to Swedenborgian thought. How are you doing today, Grant? Hey, great, Ian. It's great to be uh, be here. It's exciting. Yeah, man. It's good to see you. And just like for me personally, I uh, I grew up uh, on the next street over from you and your family. So I, you know, I knew you very well, knew your family very well. And uh, one of the backgrounds that I kind of knew you from was uh, spiritual warfare effectiveness training. It's kind of like a men's uh, gathering, kind of a men's mm-hmm. kind of retreat weekend for men to come together and talk about issues and learn tools for um, just navigating life and uh, Mm -hmm. navigating all the things that we face. So, um, but just to start, I guess, from the beginning, um, what is your educational background and uh, what is your kind of background with religion and spirituality and what initially brought you or interested you in religion and spirituality? Wow. Um, I guess ever since I was a kid, I felt pretty close to, um, I don't know, a lot of things like to a sense of, um, I don't want to say a deity when you're a kid, you know, close to God. Um, Not in the sense of being necessarily a good kid, but like just sensing there must be more to this world than what meets the eye. Um, And uh, that developed uh, as I went along. I I, uh, remember very distinctly um, one of the earliest memories of thinking about maybe becoming a minister was actually in eighth grade. I was, I was the leader of this suburban gang (laughs) and we used to steal booze out of uh, people's houses and drink them on the golf course. I think you even know where that golf course is. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was actually up on a goalpost on, you know, actually on the football field right by our house, actually our houses. And um, I'm looking out at everybody and I'm just thinking to myself, why do I know that what I'm doing is wrong? <laughs> and the, my friends don't seem to know it, you know, like, and I, I, it's, I learned later it was, that's called like the, uh, um, the prophet's burden, you know, that the, seeing something that, you know, you feel like, Hey, I've got to uh, somehow or another help people, help people move forward in life. Well, I guess it wasn't until um, college that um, seriously uh, learning more about Emanuel Swedenborg and his teachings 18th century scientist, theologian, um, about everything from the nature of God to um, the deeper symbolic meaning of of the Bible, who we are, that all of a sudden I went, wow, this is cool stuff. And I uh, really wanted to launch in. From there, I, I, I love, I love uh, Swedenborg's approach because it's like, hey, every religion has good. Uh, don't shut your mind down uh, because you're trying to be a spiritual person. Open it up. And from there... I just went into exploring all the different religions and just having a gas with life and helping people. Very cool. Very cool. (laughs) One of the things that kind of sticks out for me is, um, and I guess kind of like my, my first question kind of moving on from there is like, what is God or who is God? Um, Because I think kind of in, in the world in which we live today, Um, A lot of people have been turned off from just the idea of God because many of them were taught, you know, God is this, you know, angry, judgmental entity and uh, kind of like a a white man with a beard sitting in the clouds judging everybody. Um, And for a lot of people that was like, you know, really turned them off uh, to the concept of God. Um, and, and just what I've found in my life is just it's it, it's like there are religious texts and, and you know, you talk about the different um, you know, Eastern philosophies and Western philosophies and religions you, you've, you've studied. Um, but there are so many different incarnations and different 
ways of conceptualizing God that I think can work for different people. So I guess just kind of for you, what does that kind of mean to you of, of what is God, who is God, and, and how, how have you developed uh, a conception of God that, that works for you? Well, thanks for asking. It's a big topic and probably one of the, mo- the most important topics there is. Um, in my I, book, on, um, um, You Can Believe, uh, I start out the whole first chapter, Who is God, which it's the most important foundational thing that we can work on. Um, and at also uh, teaching the, cl- the college here, Bernathan College, a, a whole course on helping people, students develop their spiritual lives. And the first thing is, you're absolutely right. There's so many um, images of God out there as some kind of cartoon character that's going to throw lightning bolts at you if you don't do what he says. Uh, like you said, a bearded man on a, on a throne throwing out edicts and all that. And, uh, um, and you know, what I try to do is, 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 you know, let's back up and see if there is a God, what is God? You know, I mean, in the sense of like, you know, not necessarily, let's not just jump to who is God, but what is God? Because I think people do have this, you know, one dimensional image of, of somebody up there as human or, or even less human than we are running the show, you know, um, I do think one of those places where it really you can really get an idea, especially if you come out of a Judeo-Christian background, is the first time God shows up talking to Moses. Um, you know, Moses is wandering through the wilderness, sees this burning bush, you know, went like, what's this? God calls him and says, um, I want you to go. I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt. Um, I want you to go and pull them out, uh, and, you know, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And it's interesting because Moses doesn't know who he's talking to. I mean, he knows it's it's God, so to speak. So it's really interesting. He says, "So, um, okay, uh, well, whom, whom shall I tell them is has sent me?" You know, I mean, kind of like he didn't want to say, "Look, who are you?" I mean, like, whom shall I say is calling this? You know, and he gives the most profound answer um, imaginable. He says, "Tell them I am sent you. I am I who am." I love that that Yahweh. I mean. We get the name, you know, out of the uh, um, King James, Jehovah. And a lot of people think Jehovah is God's name. It's actually not. You know, Jehovah, it means literally I am. And so uh, the first thing God wants us to know, I mean, God is the very essence of life. God is the first principle. God is the creative force. God is life itself. The one thing we can say about God is God is. And I, and that is so much bigger than some man running around throwing lightning bolts around. And, and, and what I love about that is like, so Swedenborg takes that idea of, you know, life itself, God, you know, however we want to look at it, I do believe God has a personality and all that, but let's start at the essence of God that life itself, that creative force, Swedenborg turns around and says, look, you know, life itself is love. You know, and, and he talks about like, you know, love and life are the same thing. Now, right away, I mean, my students in the college are like, well, what do you mean love? I mean, like, I love that person or I'm in love or I love, you know, eating brownies. I'm like, think of love in it, you know, love in its in in its substance is is really creative energy it is positive energy um uh swedenborg defines love of god as um reaching out wanting to reach out to connect and become one with you know to bless and and so thinking about like this this being just being pure love creating us for no other reason than for objects and receiving vessels of this love of God changes everything. The way we look at, you know, we're not like, oh no, look out. It's more like, wait a minute. You mean my creator loves me completely, wholly? My creator is love? That's pretty pretty profound. You know, it's a good place to start. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. And, and you know, just, I think so many people today have become so disconnected just from the concept of love. And, and we say that word, like, yeah. you know, you leave, you leave for your work, you leave for work and you say, I love you or whatever, as you walk out the door. Um, but I think so many of us, because we have these very problematic relationships, like with our parents or with our spouse yeah. or mm-hmm. uh, siblings or coworkers or whatever. And so we just, we think that the only, the only really 
conception of love that we really understand is like maybe romantic love right yeah and and i and that is like an important part of being human but it, it's such a small part uh of being lo- of of love right and i think just like you were talking about love of existence or just love of love of the human race like even though you're not going to like every person that you meet just mm-hmm. loving people and loving their struggles and loving where they're at and um and just and just carrying yourself just in a space of not that you're in love with every single person you see but just that you can just love that they exist and lo- you know you know like yeah. how it's so easy for us to love our dogs right we just <laughs> we see dogs and cats and we love them so easily um, but it seems like loving people is so much more difficult. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm really interested. Just like, how do we expand on the concept of of what is love, and how do we just infuse love into our lives? Well, absolutely. And I, you know, every, every if, if you think about it, like say, even in terms of like what you love to do. I mean, like say, some people love music or sports. Um, uh, you know, good reading or writing or whatever it is that you love to do. Um, when you do it, how do you feel? You feel alive. You know, the more you're into it, um, the more, you know, alive, you feel vibrant, um, happy. And, and, and that, you know, that essence is God, you know, inside of us that we are loving. And I love what, you know, what you're saying there. I mean, like, we don't have to, um, I don't know, I guess I'll put it this way. Real love is wishing well to somebody. It's wishing goodness to them. And, and, and if it's appropriate to, to do what we can for them, to bring that to them. Um, but it doesn't mean that people who um, treat us poorly are people that we have to hang out with or just, you know, give our hearts to. No. Hey, you know, uh, Jesus has this, you know, this saying, I'll, I'll give the short version. You know, if somebody has, does something against you, go and talk to him about it. And if they don't listen bring two or three together and talk as witnesses and talk about it. He goes through this whole scenario. And at the end, he says, and you know, if he still doesn't listen, consider him a heathen and a publican, you know, I'm not going to get into what that might mean, but you know, basically, all right, the guy's a jerk. Okay, fine. I still wish him well. I wish him well over there, you know, but you know, uh, and I think that's, that, you know, that's love as much as anything else. You know, it's just a positive force. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, if we recognize that there is a source of it, life and love are the same. There's a source. We're like solar panels. You know, when we open up to that source and allow it to come into us and through us, that's what brings us energy, life, happiness, uh, the whole bit. And I think that's that's the whole purpose of why we were here and created. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a I, big I think, subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, talking about life is love, love is life, and, you know, doing what you love to do. And I think a lot of people um, can fall into the trap of, you know, creating in a very, like, pragmatic or practical way of saying all the reasons why they can't do what they love to do. And I can't do this because, you know, my, you know, culturally, my, it doesn't fit my culture, or my parents don't want, don't think I should do this, or, or I, I have, you know, I have kids that I have to raise, so I have to stay in this job I don't like because I have to mm-hmm. pay for food and rent for my family and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so how, how, how do you think it is maybe the best way for people to kind of find that balance of maybe not shirking all your responsibilities, but still not limiting yourself to say, oh, you can never do pursue your goals because you have to do these yeah. practical things? Well, that's another really great question. I think um, uh, I think there's cer- there's certain things. One of them is is um, we have to ask ourselves. Well, what's true? You know, I mean, we have stories. We tell ourselves stories. I, uh, lately, I've had a lot of. Uh, I, you know, um, someday we can talk about one a friend of mine who had a stroke, uh, and uh, he said he had forgotten everything about his life, and he found for a while he was a different person because he was no longer basing his life. He was a better person. I mean, he was no longer basing his life, all these old stories he told himself. Um, and then they came back. He started to remember his life and everything. But and and of course, you know, um, we are built on our, you know, on our past and how we've reacted to it and how we've, you know, formed ourselves into what we are. Um, and so but he said, he, I really learned something. He said, you know, how much our lives are simply the stories that we tell ourselves. And so can we tell ourselves a different story? And I think to a degree, 
um, we need to, uh, one of the first steps is, um, is to really take some time to look at and say, what are the stories I'm telling myself and are they true? Um, because some of them, I, I bet you, you know, for all of us, um, some of those negative stories that hold us back um, just aren't true. You know, I mean, like, no, I, I really can uh, change my work habit. You know, I know I really, I really can give a little bit more to my, my partner than I've been giving. I really don't have to work 25 hours. I can work 24, you know, I mean, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, that's important. You know, what, what are those things that, um, that can be changed, you know? And so that, that's the beginning. And then I, you know, again, take it one step at a time. The hard thing I find is, is the balance between um, doing what you love, but not at the detriment of others. Like say in a relationship is that hard, especially if you're not, there's certain places where you don't have similarities like i mean you could even get into what television show do you like to watch or something you know and you know they're going to i need to follow my dream i'm going to watch such and such show you know and um uh, no you got to share the tv I, and obviously that's a very trite example but um uh, really looking to um you know i i i want to follow my my dreams and everything but how do they dovetail with someone i've given myself uh, you know, too, whether it's a family member or a spouse or, um, or, or your job, you know, sometimes you got to make the leap. Um, sometimes it will be a mystery, but um, I've seen a lot of people run away from their responsibilities, uh, you know, in the name of it's time for me to do, it's my turn. Um, mm -hmm. Kids mm -hmm. left in the dirt, you know, uh, you know, spouses. Um, so it's a balance. It's a balance. And it's just, it's steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And what, one thing I was thinking was like, so, you know, through, you know, studying religion, going to theological school, all these different things, um, how has kind of just like your belief in God and, um, and those types of things and, and how have you kind of utilized that to kind of listen to, you know, your conscience or that small little voice of just like, like you said, when you were a kid, like you stealing booze and drinking it on the golf course, you knew that wasn't the right thing to do. Your conscience was showing up. Right. Um, and so how have you kind of utilized that, like in career choices, life choices, um, of just like, of listening to that still small voice? Um, you know, with it, I, I can't say that, uh, I feel like I've had any corner on that market <laughs> um trial and error you know it's interesting sometimes i'm I, I don't know about you but sometimes i can feel like i'm pretty close to to god in the sense of like maybe i'll talk to him or like pray a little bit more or things like that or or even have a sense that i'm being led in my life and other times i'm to i feel totally alone i forget all about god you know and it's usually when you get clobbered you know like oh yeah yeah uh, uh. and um so, you know, I go, I go through that. I think there are certain things that I try to do. One, obviously, is um, uh, walk the talk. I mean, I, you know, and again, I mean, am I trying, you know, living with integrity, you know, and that's, that's something that just doesn't come easy to anybody, I don't think. But always asking myself, is this an integrity? Am I really doing this for the right reason? Uh, uh, am I... Uh, you know, getting upset about something I don't need to. Am I being honest with somebody? Uh, integrity is very important. It's something I ask myself a lot. The other, on the other end of it, I think also is developing ritual, you know, um, and some of that could even be praying, you know, prayer. I, you know, my wife and I pray every night before bed. I read a little bit of the, the Bible to her or, or some other spiritual she goes to sleep immediately. So I'm usually the one that gets something out of it. Um, but um, that is so critical. Um, and then um, also just reading spiritual material. Uh, I don't agree with all of what I read. A lot of it I do. But any kind of spiritual material or even self-help type stuff really helps me to get going and thinking and remembering. Um, and then one more that I... Um, Sometimes I do more than others is ritual like and, you know, for me, um, you know, cultural appropriation or not, I love Native American religion and ritual. And, uh, 
you know, um, sweat lodge, you know, type stuff, get in, you know, and it's like a sauna with a prayer, you know, yeah. and it, it's ceremony you can go through. I've never felt closer to God than in a, in a Native American sweat lodge um, or um, walking through the woods and just getting connected. I, I love getting away and listening. I, I remember, you know, I, you know, in the art of spiritual warfare, I talk a lot about nature as an ally. Um, but I really needed and wanted to learn, you know, about learn about nature. And I was being trained by a tracker. Um, and you probably remember him. His name was Jerry Finkelday. And uh, mm -hmm. he uh, took on a, 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 I don't know if you call it an animal name, but he calls himself Crazy Bald Man. And uh, mm -hmm. um, he taught me everything about, he taught me uh, so much. Uh, we used to, hunt, I mean, go up to his father's place and hunt when we were kids, deer hunt. Then I hadn't seen him in years and years and came back and he taught me, he taught me the ways, I mean, the ways of, um, uh, of walking in the spirit in nature in all different ways. Um, but one of the things I remember saying to him was that, you know, I was trying to figure out all this stuff. Like, well, you know, they talk about in all Native American religion, you know, that, that nature is alive and teaches you. And you know, Swedenborg talks about that. Everything is symbolic and the life of a tree can teach us so much or water you know, and how it, you know, if it's still or rushing or whatever, it has a lesson to learn and the wind, all that. So I'm sitting there trying to figure this all out. I want to become one of these shaman guys, you know, and I know all, and, and I'm just not hearing it, you know, like, you know, okay, I hear the wind. What does it mean? I don't know. This animal walks by. It's a skunk. I don't want to know what it means. No, but uh, I, I'm sitting by a fire with Jerry and I just say, Jerry, I just don't get it. I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. And uh, it's just not talking to me. I, I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing anything. I just remember his words. He's like, Grant, get out of your head. Get out of your head. They don't. The, the message isn't through some intellectual voice. It's through a feeling. It's through a feeling. I mean, and that blew me away. All of a sudden I got it, you know. Um, so I was a long way of saying, but you can, you know, I think you can see from what I'm talking about is the exploration is going deep into it is finding God. Uh, not only in ritual, but in nature or in prayer or reading the Bible or talking to your wife, you know. Um, so there are some of the ways. But I got to tell you, you know, I, I struggle every day with trying to get connected with God, just like anybody else. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're saying about ritual, I think, is is really on point. Um, and, you know, they even just, you know, you talk about how, you know, you don't fall asleep super easily. I'm in the same boat. Like my wife falls asleep so, so easily. It takes me forever to fall asleep. Um, but yeah, like the, I think ritual and initiatory practices, right? Like that, yeah. you know, I think one of the things that culturally that we've kind of gotten away from is like these initiatory, initiatory yeah. practices of like, okay, now you are a man. Okay. Now you are a woman and you're, you're an adult now. And here's this, 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 rite of passage that we're going to put you through uh, to, you know, help you develop confidence in yourself and understand who you are, who you are in the universe, and, and just like, help you have clarity about the meaning of your life, you know, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, I remember doing the sweat lodges at sweat, mm -hmm. um, yeah. incredibly powerful and, and, and cool. Um, and yeah, just all different types of, uh, of those types of experiences of just like, kind of putting yourself through the ringer to like, okay, you get to the other side and you feel like you've accomplished something. Um, but yeah, I, it's just it's so interesting. I mean, I think connecting with nature is so important. And you mentioned, you know, sitting by the fire. And I think uh, one of the things that we've kind of lost as a culture is like sitting around the fire with people. And, you know, I, I, I live in the desert and people, mm -hmm. people have fires sometimes and stuff. And whenever we have a chance to go camping and have a fire, we love it. But I, 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 I think, you know, if you think back to, you know, maybe times when, when we, you know, lived in tribes and, and we would all mm -hmm. gather around the fire at night. And that was this kind of like right. so social experience and, you know, maybe, you know, have music and dance and all that and just like sit and, and, cause I think it is such a, just being near a fire is such a relaxing experience and it, it's cleansing. Right. And, and you're talking about the message of, of, running water or this type mm -hmm. of animal or that type of plant. Mm -hmm. um, but fire is just, um, fire is such a cleansing thing. And it's, it's, it just puts, you know, it puts to, to me, I think it just puts me so much at rest and like all that anxiety um, that I often carry can just like 
fall away. So, and I imagine you you would have like some insight on the uh, the the the, uh, the symbolism of, of fire. Well, absolutely, it's just interesting because it takes us full circle. I mean, the sense that um, uh, symbolism uh, in in a lot of different uh, cultures, but uh, you know, talking about Swedenborg, he talks about there in all symbolism, anything you you can find something positive and also negative, um, wholesome and destructive. So fire, as we can see, fire represents, symbolizes love, you know, so, um, but there's, there's warm love that, you know, the kind of love that protects us, that um, um, uh, keeps us, uh, well, keeps us warm, keeps us safe, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's the love that we use to hate people, you know, it's the same. It's the same thing. It's this this energy again. How are we using it? Um, but going back to that story is really interesting of of Moses in the burning bush because, you know, here was his first encounter with God, right? That we were just the kind of God we were just talking about, and he looks at this bush, and the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed, and you know that's what. Isn't that what God is? The fire that does not consume. It's it's giving light. So he's like, I got to go over and look at this. This is uh, this is unusual. And I think for each of us, I mean, even in a deeper level, if you talk about the Moses within us or the Jehovah, Yehovah within us, I think for for many people, um, or maybe uh, anybody on a spiritual path, one of the earliest things is recognizing that there is something out there. Here's he's work, he's in the wilderness. He's he's walked away from life. He left Egypt, you know. And coming across this fire that does not consume and it speaks to you. It's like there's something out there. You know, and maybe there's something out there that cares about me, <laughs> you know? Uh there's there I can't name it. I don't even know what it is, but it's but I'm going to pursue it. And, you know, and go over, I'm going to take a look at this and then hear it speak and how Moses and the relationship he developed with God, you know, is the whole story, almost of the Old Testament where, you know, um, just amazing stuff. So, again, there's symbolism there. Yeah, I got a fire pit in my backyard. And it's, uh, you know, um, again, it's one of those things where I can. uh I get into the habit. And so, you know, we'll go out every weekend and have a fire and just have these amazing times. And then, you know, forget all about it for a few months until I go, why are we doing fires out there and get back out there? But I, I agree with you. That's a just beautiful, uh, simple kind of relaxing ritual, you know, really. Yeah, is. absolutely. And I, I think, you know, when talking about fire, um, it really makes me think about, like you said, that spark, right. Um, and that, that, that fire of love. And, and this is, this is a big question too. Um, and I guess, um, you know, I'll ask it, I'll, I'll ask it anyway, but how, how does one bring that spark, bring that fire into their relationships or back into their relationships? Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I think again, I mean, we go back, you've said it, I mean, it's interesting. Love relationships are um, the greatest gift from God, probably because they're the most work, right? And so we have to work on ourselves, you know, and it's mm -hmm. easy, like we were talking about, it's easy to love your pet. Your pet looks right back at you and, and loves you. I, or it's easy to love your neighbor when they live two streets down, you know, but the neighbor that's sleeping in the bed beside you or squeezing the toothpaste out of the, you know, tube the wrong way or not cleaning up after that, that's a different neighbor, you know? So uh, it really starts right there. I think um, uh, use those things that you know are right, that you have learned since you were a kid about loving others and forgiving and going the second mile with that person who is the closest to you is the beginning. And I, you know, I, I, that whole story about how do you rekindle the flame? I think the flame of um, romance um, is nature's way of getting us together. <laughs> but the real flame is something very deep. Um, uh, you know, the embers burn, burn deep. Uh, it's the only way I can think of saying it. And, uh, um, but those things are more subtle. They, 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 it takes more patience. It takes time. It takes, it takes a lot of time 
it takes showing up. It takes growth. Um, and, I, you know, some of that's from experience. Some of that's just something I really feel and sense, but I'm still striving for it on my own. Uh, so, you know, one thing I, when I teach, uh, I do teach a, a, a section on love relationships with the college students. And I, I really do say, if you want a, a good relationship, it starts with you. You know, I mean, if you want to, you know, the best thing you can do for your relationship is work on yourself. Um, because, you know, that's going to change you. That's going to have an effect on them. If two people are working on themselves, how can they lose in the sense of at least coming together to, in some way or another? Now, people have issues, people have problems, people have things that they, I believe they cannot overcome together. I mean, uh, and that's another whole issue. But I mean, if you're in the game, play the game, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I play guess- just, everything you got. Yeah, and then just, you know, adding to that. So, I mean, what, just from a, from a starting point, um, what do you think are the best ways that people can work on themselves? Well, again, I think you need to go back to, I mean, uh, Swedenborg lays out- four steps, self-examination, looking at yourself and being honest with yourself. And I think I started talking about that one, you know, integrity, where am I out of integrity and, and, and not doing it all the time. I mean, some people, they just are always looking at themselves and questioning themselves and that'll drive anybody nuts. I mean, I just occasionally look at yourself and like, okay, um, is there something I'm, I'm holding back from this relationship? Is there something I'm, I'm afraid to ask, ask for her. That's another one. Uh, uh, is there, is there something that, uh, I mean, what is lacking? I think that's something. So in the um, second step is, uh, is really realizing, realizing the issues, realizing the problem. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's very similar to the 12 steps, uh, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, Swedenborg, basically self-examination. Where are the issues that you need to work on? Ask God for help and just start, start one thing at a time, you know, and those four steps will take you a long way. Um, yeah, there's so many examples I could give where, you know, I, I, you know, all of a sudden realized, man, I'm way off base, you know, and then just take a step or two to try to get back onto base. So it's not, it's not glamorous, you know, it's not, it's not exciting, you know, it, it really is just starting with yourself with, Looking at yourself, make those changes you need to make one step at a time. It starts to roll, you know, like a snowball, you know, it, it'll start to go. And, um, and life's a process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think just, it, it kind of does go full circle back to what you're saying at the beginning about like listening to your conscience, you know, like I, even as a kid, like you hear it, like, I, I think mm -hmm. we, we as human beings, like, wherever a person believes that comes from, like we do have a sense of right and wrong and what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And if you make a bunch of actions where you're not really listening to that voice, you might, I mean, you might get in a place where you're not going to like the consequences. It's like every, yeah. every action has a reaction and, you know, our, what we do has consequences, you know? So I, I, I really like that. And I, I just I'm thinking so much on what you said about, like when God in the burning bush answers Moses and like, you know, I am that I am. It's like, mm -hmm. and, you know, cause like, it just makes you think of, and from a different, you know, kind of a uh, spiritual background, like just from the Tao Te Ching of the Tao yeah. that can be expressed is not the eternal Tao. The name that Absolutely. can be named. Yeah. The name that can be named is not the unchanging name, you know? So just like to, to give God a name would be, you know, would be trying to box it in, you know? And I, I guess like what I encourage, you know, anyone, anyone who watches this to, to consider is, is, you know, just this, this idea of just, I mean, existence, like you said, like love, life, existence, like that's like, that's love. That's God. God is love. Like all these things, like if we exist, you know, we, in some capacity, we are love and we are just, you know, yes. existence as it is. Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because um, from there, uh, you know, I, I absolutely, um, every religion takes, or as much as they understand it, takes that concept and brings it, brings it into some kind of tangible uh, human understanding, which I think is good. I mean, in the mm -hmm. sense of like, for example, Christianity in the idea that 
Jesus is an incarnation of that divine is an awesome thing and something that I actually believe myself. Um, mm -hmm. But to but, you know, Swedenborg says, don't think of God from person to essence. Don't immediately go. God is a an old man up there because then you can't get to what God really is. But if you think of God from essence to person, you're starting with love itself, life itself, and then allowing that to come into someone like Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth and the life, you know, that human form lifting us to that higher form. I mean, so and that works in so many places. Like, that's what the Tao Te Ching is really about. I mean, you know, in the sense of like the way, you know, the way of life, um, opening yourself up to that way to I mean, again, they would different words are used, but to the divine, to the way of life, to life itself. And it's the same thing. It's just a different incarnation, so to speak, you know, of, of, of God. By the way, that's a really interesting one because Christians, when they first, when their first uh, church, they didn't call themselves Christians. That was made up by the Romans. It was actually a derogatory term. You probably, you know, like, ah, oh, those Christians, you know, they called their religion, so to speak, the way. I love that. Are you in the way? Do you know the way? Um, and imagine if we kept those things like what if the entire Old Testament, every time it said Jehovah, we had kept the translation, I am. What mm -hmm. a I mean, what an esoteric thing. I mean, I mean, and then I am spoke, you know, um, wow. I mean, it would blow people's, it, you couldn't make Jehovah some bad dude up there shooting at you, you know? Um, so it's just exciting because when you really dig in, you find out a lot of these religions, I mean, if you go all the way back, um, there's a connection, you know, and, uh, you know, another, you know, just, uh, um, one more thing. I think the, what I don't like about what people have done with religion is a lot of people will tell you, God loves you, you know, or God is loving, but you know, if you don't belong to this religion, you gotta go to hell, you know, or whatever, or, or God's, you know, God loves you, but you know, his, you, you're not standing up to his truth and righteousness. So you gotta go to hell. I mean, it's like, it's not that God, God loves you. God is love. You know, there's a big difference. The I am is love. And, uh, you know, anybody that says God loves you, but, and they're, they got to, they're missing something. And I think that's what people have done with the dogma. You know, I, you know, there's so much we could talk about, you know, I'm sure we will yeah. be talking again, but, uh, I know we are, but, yeah. um, I it's just the beginning. It's just a fascinating, I love the subject, obviously. And it's, you could talk about the divine forever, you know, infinite. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's just such a, such a cool point you made. Um, if the Bible did say, and then I am said, right. Instead of saying God or, or, or whatever. I mean, that's, that's such a cool way to put it. So yeah, we got a, a you know, talked about a, a couple good, real good uh, talking points here and yeah, it'll just give us a, give us a platform to maybe do this again. So Grant, oh, thank absolutely. you so much. And I hope we can do it again, man. Absolutely. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks.